This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. Happy day five. It's day five. Five, one, two, three, four, five. Five gold rings. Yep, there that's you go. what that is. It you is. Ready to go? Yeah, let's go. All right, here we go. On November 10th, 1986, the Redlands, California Police Department received an urgent phone call from a concerned woman. She reported that her highly responsible employee, 20 year old Karina Nobis, had failed to show up for work for several days, which was uncharacteristic of her. Karina had recently relocated from Idaho to California and was working diligently to support her education. The caller, who was Karina's boss, informed the police that she had visited Karina's apartment to check on her. To her shock, she discovered that the front door was wide open and Karina's car was missing from its usual parking spot. Upon entering the apartment, it became apparent that someone had ransacked the place, leaving it in a state of complete chaos. These unsettling signs confirmed the suspicion that something had happened to Karina. Officer Scott Smith makes his way to the apartment. Upon their arrival, the police initiated an investigation and quickly observed that there were no signs of forced entry into the apartment. However, it was quite evident that someone had gone through all the drawers. Upon speaking with the family member, it was confirmed that a typewriter and her answering machine were also missing from the apartment. Now, you got to remember, this is 1986, so there's, you know, that was a big deal to have a typewriter and an answering machine. None of Karina's family or friends had seen or heard from her in several days, which was worrisome and totally unlike her. This absence was especially concerning because she had not attended the University of Redlands homecoming activities. And this was an event she would never have missed. And it was fun. You know, you're a young kid. That's part of the fun to go to college. The combination of all these unsettling details deepened the mystery surrounding her disappearance. And it actually raised more questions about where she was. As news of Karina's disappearance began to circulate in the media and spread throughout the area, the Redlands Police Department received an intriguing phone call from the Laguna Police Department. A sergeant from the Laguna Police Department reported that a manager of a local convenience store had discovered something near his dumpster. Officer Smith reported to the scene and found not only Karina's driver's license near the dumpster, but also a set of her personal checks. Now, these checks had been signed with a signature that was supposed to be hers, but it was really more somebody practicing her signature. Mm -mm. In addition to this, they came across a Department of Corrections card indicating a prison discharge. And that's the name which I didn't even realize they give that to you. Maybe they did then and they don't now. I don't know. You know, a name on the card saying that you had served time, but you had completed your time and you were now free. Hmm. Okay. The name on the card was James Marlowe. And there was also a driver's license belonging to someone else named Cynthia Kaufman. These findings introduced new elements to the investigation, but now it's becoming clear that something awful really did happen to Karina. All of those items, by the way, were found in a fast food bag. So I'm thinking they ate and tossed some things in there, not realizing that their stuff was in there as well. Following a background check on both James Marlowe and Cynthia Kaufman, the police uncovered concerning information, particularly about James Marlowe. Cynthia had a minor criminal record, but nothing big. James, on the other hand, his background check raised some major red flags. Marlowe had a history of multiple arrests on charges ranging from armed robbery and burglary 
to narcotics and auto theft, among others. Notably, he had served time in prison, hence why he had the card. Given James Marlowe's extensive criminal history, the police grow increasingly concerned about his potential involvement in Karina's disappearance, but they also begin to wonder if maybe Cynthia Kaufman is his second victim. The fear was that James, who had experienced life behind bars and likely (laughs) wanted to avoid going back, Mm -hmm. I'm sure, might resort to extreme measures, including violence, to ensure his freedom, even if that meant harming someone he initially intended just to rob. With this unsettling information at hand, the police recognized the urgency of locating James Marlowe as quickly as possible to determine his connection to Karina's disappearance and to prevent any further potential harm. The investigation took on a new level of intensity as they worked tirelessly to track down Marlowe and gather more evidence in the case. A break comes in via telephone, and police learn that someone named Veronica Coppers was trying to sell Karina's answering machine at a pawn shop. Police go and find Veronica, and they pull her into the station, and she tells them a little interesting thing. James Marlowe is her brother. Hmm. She also tells police that Cynthia Kaufman is not a victim, but is in fact James's girlfriend. She also alludes to the fact that James and Cynthia had some prior contact with Karina. After some more investigation, police learned that James and Cynthia were selling drugs, mostly meth, and in fact, they were pretty big time dealers. So they need to know what they're working with. So they're going to look into the backgrounds of James and Cynthia, and so are we. James was born on May 11, 1965, in Ohio to a woman described by crime writer Dean Lassiter as a, quote, Kentucky hillbilly. I'm not sure exactly what that is. I mean, I think I do, but, you know, characterized by her beauty, but also noted for her complete lack of moral principles. That's how he described her. When her marriage dissolved, she took young James with her and relocated to Kentucky, where his early life was marked by significant abuse and neglect. James's mother, who grappled with drug addiction, worked as a sex worker, and she often brought clients into her home and would sometimes perform explicit acts in front of young James. Shockingly, she even taught him to go through the client's coats and wallets while she was entertaining the gentleman. Wow. Uh, right. So she introduced him to a very early age to the life of crime. And I'm I'm guessing with a little kid like that, you're not going to really think about that because you're kind of busy. Right. You know? Subsequently, she married another man and had another child, Veronica. However, once the novelty of the new marriage wore off, she frequently left the children with anyone she could persuade to look after them. She'd promise, you know, I'm going to return in a few hours. But in fact, those few hours would stretch into weeks. Could you imagine no. leaving your children with the neighbor? I just got to run to the store. I'm going to be back in a few hours. And then totally And you're gone them. three weeks. Mm-hmm. Three weeks. James's life took an even darker turn when at the age of 10, he began stealing and robbing people, off, you know, just off the street, basically. Due to the situation, he was sent to live with his father in Ohio, but his father subjected him to regular beatings and even confined him to a cabinet for an extended period of time like throw him in a cabinet and make him stay there. Ultimately, his mother agreed to take him back despite her troubled circumstances. James Morrow's early life was a tale of neglect, abuse, and exposure to criminal behavior, setting the stage for a complex, needless to say, dangerous adulthood. However, at the deeply troubling age of 13, his mother made the horrifying decision to introduce him to her greatest passion which just happened to be drugs. I about cried when I read this. She administered Mm -hmm. IV drugs to the barely teenage boy. Now, this, of course, would have long-lasting and devastating consequences for James's entire life. You think? But, Jen, if that's not horrific enough, she then seduced him. and What? Yeah, Uh, she, I would say, raped him. I think that's... I I, think that is what it's called, yes. So James would say later he didn't know it was wrong since he loved his mother. He believed that this was love, and this is what people did when they loved their parent at 13. By the time James reached the age of 16, he moved to California at 16 by himself. That's better than moving with his mom. How much worse could it get? It was during this period that he entered into his first marriage, although it proved to be short-lived. 
Another event occurred that would have a lasting impact on his life, and that was that he had learned that his mother had tragically died in a fire. This news, I mean, it sent him down a deep, dark tunnel of despair, even though she had abused him. And I guess Mm -hmm. this is, it's that love of your parent Mm -hmm. and not realizing all those things were wrong. This really took a toll on him. He started abusing drugs and his criminal activities really stepped up. These crimes resulted in repeated incarcerations and James' troubling pattern of abuse toward women who seemed to care for him started right here. His life became marked by a cycle of criminality, incarceration, and tumultuous relationships, all fueled by the despair he felt following his mother's tragic death. And that's what he would say, too, that this all was because his mother died. In 1980, James Marlowe found himself incarcerated at Folsom Prison due to a string of armed robberies at Knife Point and home invasions. Now here, this is interesting, he served a three-year sentence at the institution, and this was at the time in the 70s and 80s. This was like the peak violence inside the prison at Folsom. It became increasingly dangerous. This is when all the gangs started popping up, like the Mexican Mafia, the Black Gorilla Family, Mm -hmm. the Aryan Nation, all those. They were like in the big time swing of things right here in the 70s and 80s. You can see where I'm going to go with this. Mm -hmm. I can. During his time at Folsom, James proudly adorned himself with a collection of neo-Nazi and Aryan Brotherhood tattoos, which not only earned him a reputation, but also gave rise to his nickname, the Folsom Wolf. He had a tattoo of a howling wolf on his ribcage. Yeah. So they called him Folsom Wolf. Folsom, yeah. Am I saying that right? With Johnny Cash. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. what I keep thinking. Folsom Blues. In May 1983, James was released from prison, and he seemed to stay clean for approximately three years. Clean from crime, clean from drugs. In 1986, that all changes, and he would end up back in jail, where he meets a man who happened to be a cellmate by the name of Doug Huntley. Doug happened to be the boyfriend of Cynthia Kaufman. Now, while in custody, Doug would rave on and on about his wonderful girlfriend, Cynthia, and what a great person she was to James. I know I say this, I can't even tell you how many times, but I just find it so interesting when like paths collide mm-hmm. and it's like just things, I, what are the chances that this happens and then how this unfolds? It's just, I don't know, fate, destiny. I don't know. Cynthia Lynn Kaufman came into this world on January 19th, 1962. And guess where, Jen? That's right. St. Louis, Missouri. She she was born to a pretty well-to-do St. Louis businessman and his wife, and they were raising all of their children to be devout Catholics. So the idyllic family portrait would soon be shattered. At the age of six, her father abandoned the family and her mother on one occasion attempted to even give away Cynthia and her two brothers. Two strangers. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Here, do you want them? This early abandonment by her father marked the first of a series of influential events that would contribute to her seeking the wrong type of relationship. You know. You know what she's looking for. Mm-hmm. According to an article by L.A. Times writer Nancy Ride, written on April 26, 1992, Kaufman stated, The reason that she started all this was to, quote, to get attention. I'd like to get in trouble. And for that, I'll always remember the taste of Dove, meaning Dove soap. So from a little child, she would act out and do things to get in trouble. At 16, she experimented with marijuana for the first time. By 18, she found herself pregnant and entered into a loveless marriage. This was uh, how her Catholic upbringing really played into part here. So she really wanted to try to make this work, right, to stay married, to have a baby. During this time, Cynthia worked at a factory to make ends meet, but the marriage was very far from happy. And even though it endured five years before Cynthia finally ended it, it was time to go. And when that happened, she decided to leave. She wanted a brand new, fresh start. So she and a friend journeyed to Page, Arizona. Once she had established herself there with a job and a suitable place to live, she had planned to bring her son to Arizona. That would never happen. In Arizona, Cynthia took on the role of a waitress and soon crossed paths with a man named Doug Huntley. That's right, Doug Huntley. The two of them decided to live together. However, the relationship took a turn when on May 8, 1986, in Barstow, California, they were pulled over by a 
police for running a stop sign. A vehicle was searched and the law enforcement officers found a loaded Derringer gun and methamphetamines in Cynthia's purse. After being brought into the police station, Cynthia was released on her own recognizance and charges against her were ultimately dismissed. However, her boyfriend, Doug, faced a different outcome, serving a six-week sentence in the county jail. While visiting Doug in jail, Cynthia crossed paths with the man who happened to be Doug's cellmate. That's right. This man was James Gregory Marlowe, and he was incarcerated for stealing his sixth wife's car. Six. Six. Oh, okay. one, one, two, three, four, five, six. No judgment. I'm just, that's a lot because he's not that old. <laughs> that's, Yeah. And he's not Elizabeth Taylor. That's a red flag right there. So James, it seems, gets released before Doug. So James goes to the couple's apartment and claimed that Doug had requested him, meaning James, to stay there and watch over Cynthia while Doug serves out the rest of his time. That's a little odd. Somebody knocks at the door and you're like, hey, I was the cellmate of your boyfriend and he told me to come over here and stay with you. But she lets him in. So initially, this arrangement appeared to be pretty innocent. But when Doug was released from prison, he ended up going right back shortly afterwards. It was then that Cynthia and James embarked on a romantic relationship that she would later describe as very tumultuous. James would call Cindy Cynthia, like Sin with the S-I-N, you know. mm -hmm. And her nickname for him was Squeeze. Squeeze and Cynthia. Wow. Hmm. Little Sid Nancy vibe. Maybe little, little, I, you know I what I mean? It, I, I totally, because they did lots and lots of drugs. Uh-huh. I think lots of abuse, violence. Yes. Yeah, that's what it reminds me of, said Nancy. Mm, me too. Soon the couple started visiting remote high desert locations, regularly using crystal methamphetamine by injection. Their journey took them eastward to Kentucky, where their violent cross-country rampage would begin. Now, along the way to Kentucky, I would be remiss if I did not mention this little tidbit, so you kind of know who we're dealing with here. Kaufman and Marlowe had an informal marriage ceremony on top of a motorcycle. They got married on a motorcycle. Now, Cynthia celebrated the occasion, marking the occasion would be a better choice of words, by having her buttocks tattooed with the unmistakable, quote, I belong to the Folsom Wolf, or... In other documents, it read property of Folsom Wolf, and I found both. So I'm not sure which it is, but you get the idea Mm -hmm. there. Throughout the relationship, Marlowe subjected Kaufman to frequent episodes of physical abuse, including beatings, biting, and even cutting off her hair in the style of a crew cut. That's when she was finally arrested. That was the hairdo she had. Despite these violent outbursts, Marlowe would consistently apologize and shower his girlfriend with affection and mm. always win her back. Love yeah, bombing. That sounds familiar, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Upon their arrival in Kentucky on July 26, 1986, Kaufman and Marlowe were connected to a residential burglary in Whitley County, during which they took money and valuable jewelry and a shotgun. Now, following this, Kaufman and Marlowe went and, I guess, committed a ruthless execution-style murder of a drug dealer that they both knew in Kentucky. Now, Marlowe would confess to law enforcement that he, with Kaufman's assistance, had shot the drug dealer in exchange for a sum of $5,000. You take somebody's life for $5,000. $5,000. Wow. They made their way back to California on October 11th, 1986, and committed yet another murder. Costa Mesa resident, 32-year-old Sandra Neary, left to go to the bank to get some money from the ATM. Her vehicle was discovered in a parking lot, but was nowhere to be found. On October 24th, Sandra's body was discovered by hikers in Corona, California. She had been strangled. The murder spree continued when 35-year-old Pamela Simmons went missing from Bullhead City, Arizona. Just like Sandra, her car was found nearby. Police believed that she was abducted as she was trying to take money out of the ATM. 
On November 7th, Karina Nobis, a 20-year-old, disappeared while running an errand in Redlands, California. Now, Karina had gone to a nearby shopping mall and had mysteriously went missing. Kaufman and Marlowe approached Karina and requested a ride. Using a firearm as a threat, they forced her inside, and then they took her to a residence of one of Marlowe's friends. There, she was handcuffed, gagged, and subjected to sexual assault. The devious duo rode in Novus's vehicle to the Orange County coast. Cynthia and James lived off her bank and credit cards and looked for their next victim. On November 12th, the duo encountered Lionel Murrays, a 19-year-old student at Golden West College, who had missed a scheduled meeting with her boyfriend, causing him to become concerned. Lionel was employed at a local dry cleaners in Huntington Beach and was preparing to close up shop when Kaufman approached her. Cynthia and James proceeded to commit a robbery at the establishment, stealing both money and clothing. Afterward, they coerced Murray into their Honda and drove to the Huntington Beach Inn. There, Marlowe sexually assaulted her, subjected her to physical abuse, blindfolded her, and ultimately strangled her with a towel. The lifeless body of Lionel was discovered face down in a filled bathtub by a cleaning maid who had arrived to tidy up the room. Her vehicle was located in the parking area of her workplace in Orange County, California. On November 14th, the pair attempted to wipe all fingerprints from the car and then abandoned the car in the Running Springs neighborhood within the San Bernardino Mountains. The authorities were anxiously awaiting a breakthrough in the case, and when it finally materialized, the investigation swiftly began to unfold. Initially, they discovered Karina's driver's license in that dumpster. That's how we started the episode out. And then the police located Marlowe and Kaufman staying in a motel room in San Bernardino. The motel manager became concerned upon finding writings in the room that appeared to be an attempt to imitate Lionel Murray's signature, much like they did with Karina. Combining all this information together, a statewide alert was issued for both fugitives. On November 14, 1986, law enforcement received a call to investigate a mountain lodge in Big Bear, California. The lodge's owner identified his most recent guest as Marlowe and Kaufman. A posse consisting of around 100 individuals scoured the lounge but found it vacant. They then spread out to the surrounding woods and had a breakthrough at approximately 3 p.m. when they located the suspects, Kaufman and Marlowe, hiking along a mountain road. Without putting up any resistance, both were taken into custody. Notably, they were wearing the clothing that they had stole from the dry cleaning shop. Authorities also discovered several earrings belonging to Murray, which had previously been described in a police bulletin as potential trophies. Just hours later, Cynthia provided law enforcement with crucial information that led them to a vineyard in the vicinity of Fontana. There, officers discovered the lifeless body of Karina Novus, who had been subjected to sexual assault and strangulation. Her remains were found in a shallow grave. On November 17th, Marlowe and Kaufman faced formal charges for the murder and were detained without the option of posting a bond. In a press conference, homicide investigators disclosed to the media that fingerprints belonging to both defendants had been discovered inside Karina's vehicle, and Kaufman had been connected to the Fontana pawn shop where the victim's typewriter had been pawned. Kaufman's defense strategy involved presenting testimony from an expert on battered women's syndrome. So you have to remember at this time, the battered women's syndrome was a relatively new concept. I believe it was first introduced into the courtroom in the 70s. This is the defense strategy that her team's going to take. They would say that Cynthia was so afraid of James Marlowe that she simply went along with him because she was battered, starved, and brainwashed by James Marlowe that even when she had a chance to run, because she did, she was afraid to do so. Additionally, she claimed that Marlowe had informed her that he was affiliated with white supremacist groups and had committed acts of violence against black individuals while in prison. However, during Marlowe's rebuttal testimony, he denied having engaged in any such actions or even making such statements. Marlowe testified that it was actually Kaufman who proposed the idea of killing Karina Novas. Now, according to his account, he had only intended to steal her car and obtain her personal ID to withdraw money from the ATM. Marlowe contended that it was Kaufman who insisted that she be killed. Isn't it interesting when the criminals turn on each other? They always blame each other. Mm Mm-hmm. Of course they do. 
The prosecutors would say in regards to the pair, quote, they were two flaky sociopaths separately. But when you put them together, it was like Bonnie and Clyde all the way. I kind of like that quote because I I think we see that a lot in true crime. mm -hmm. Like people are odd and they're not quite right. But then they they have to find that missing piece, right? And then it gives them the strength to uh, go at it. So various witnesses took the stand as well as testimony from actual police officers. One such witness was a cellmate of Cynthia Kaufman who said that she took pride and took credit for the murders. So there's no, he did it and I just went, right? So the murder trial of the couple finally commenced in San Bernardino County on July 18th, 1989. As is so often the case, both of the perpetrators turn against each other, blaming each other for their actions, which is what I just said, what we just said. Mm Mm-hmm. In a verdict handed down by San Bernardino Superior Court jury, both defendants were found guilty of multiple charges in connection with the murders of Karina Novus, including kidnapping, kidnapping for robbery, robbery, residential burglary, and forcible sodomy. Additionally, jurors decided on the death penalty for both defendants. This decision appeared to dismiss Kaufman's claim that she had only followed Marlowe due to his threats and violence, driven by fear for her six-year-old son's safety. So she would later say she did all this because he was threatening to hurt her son back in Missouri. Kaufman's lawyers would contend that she should not be executed because she was less culpable than Marlowe. The judge did not see it that way, stating, quote, Kaufman, 24 years old at the time of the offenses, was found by the jury to have committed murder and to have engaged in the charged felonies with the intent to kill or to aid or abet Marlowe in killing the victims. The jury also heard evidence that Kaufman, together with Marlowe, had committed another similar murder and other felony offenses in Orange County. The jury was not persuaded that Kaufman suffered from such physical abuse or emotional or psychological oppression as to warrant a sentence less than death. Contrary to Kaufman's argument, The offenses here were of the most serious nature, and her sentence befits her culpability, end quote. On August 30th, both Cynthia and James were formally sentenced to death for their involvement in the Novus murder. Kaufman also received a life without parole sentence for her role in the Murray killing, while Marlowe received another death penalty sentence for his actions in the Murray case. Subsequently, on August 19th, 2004, the California Supreme Court upheld the death sentences for both James Marlowe and Cynthia Kaufman. Today, James Marlowe is 67 years old and remains on death row in San Quentin Prison, whereas Cynthia Kaufman is now 61 years old and is sitting on death row at the Central California Women's Facility. And that is the story of James Marlowe and Cynthia Kaufman. Wow. And when you look at them next to each other, you'd never put them together. Mm -hmm. Like, he looks rough, and she looks not rough. (laughs) They both so, have uh, horrible backgrounds. Yeah, it's it was a lot, but you know, a lot of people have horrible backgrounds that, and that don't do that. Right? Make you serial I killers. I stayed away from the graphic stuff, but there's some really, really graphic stuff that they did with those poor girls and ladies. I just I can't mean, get into get, it. Right? Well, you just you know you know mm-hmm. what happened. They're they're evil people. They're exactly. terrible. There's a reason they're sitting on death row for crime and sake. But anyway, fascinating. I've never five. heard of them. Honestly, I've never. Like, sometimes I get a little, uh, kind of recognize the names. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Not really know the crimes, but totally new to me. And you know Doug Huntley? Mm-hmm. Not personally, but. No, I mean, like, <laughs> if he wouldn't have been cellmates with this, I, it, those two would have never met. I know. It's just weird. I originally wrote this as a regular episode, and then I was like, wait a minute. That's <laughs> five people. <laughs> That's, That's a five, five days of Christmas. It is. So that's. They're nightmares. Uh, they they are nightmares. People. Terrible people. I just don't understand why people do what they do. I wish somebody could explain that to me. I just don't understand. Mm. It's one of those things that drives me nuts. Drives me nuts. Well, I hope everybody is enjoying their holiday season. It's going very quickly, as it always does. Each year goes by quicker, Jen. I know. The older we get. I I don't like it. Well, I'm not old. You are. But but anyway, tomorrow, it's back over to you for day six. I hope everybody is enjoying their holiday season, whichever holiday it is that you celebrate or will celebrate or have celebrated, depending on, you know, where you are. You understand what uh, we're saying. You know, I hope we're making it easy for you to get through it all. Yeah. We appreciate you listening and taking time out of your day. We always appreciate appreciate you. More than you know, really Mm -hmm. more than you know. When Jen and I get a nice review or some nice words, it's like, 
just makes our day. It does. I'm, I know we say I, that all the time, but it really it's does. It's true, though. You don't know. Even we won't tell you what we do when we, get a, <laughs> when we get a bad review. You won't, we won't tell you what we do no. with those. You can imagine. Trust us. But anyway, can't wait for day six. I know. It's a good one. Halfway there almost. I know. Okay. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Until next time. We'll see you tomorrow. Remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at artruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all Our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Bertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Bertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Mm-hmm.